It's been around for quite a little while. Uh, the idea is, here's an iceberg, and the very top layer is the basic stuff that everyone's gonna know, but as you go progressively lower down the iceberg, you're gonna get into the most obscure things, being on the bottom, the really dark, the really, really obscure, the really crazy stuff that happens. For example, the top layer of like a Star Wars iceberg would be something like Chewbacca, or The Force, or Lightsaber. And the very bottom would be something like the Star Wars Christmas special. So I wanted to do the iceberg for music, for classical music. <laughs> Excuse me, this is Bridger from the editing future telling you that he meant to say this is an iceberg for Western classical music and all of the music derived from Western Europe, aka the classical canon. Okay? Got it? As I was scouring the internet for the perfect classical music iceberg, what I found was that most of them are way too comprehensive. There's just too many options, too many things to go through, and to really do a deep dive and comprehensive list of all of that, it's gonna take me about a billion years, um, and this video is gonna just go way, way, way too long. So instead, what I did is I took about maybe six or seven uh, for each category that are from all these individual lists that I think are worth discussing here, and I put them all together with the intent of being clear and concise and short with each answer. I don't know if I'm gonna actually follow through with that, but we'll see. If you want to see me do like the full iceberg of one of these, you know, like with every single option out there, please let me know in the comments. Please let me know if this is the kind of thing you wanna see. But for now, let's just do my little iceberg comprehensive list. Let's go. Level zero, AKA 10 hours of relaxing classical music to sleep or study to. So this one in particular is referring to the trend that's going on on YouTube of videos that are 10 hours long, along the same veins as like lo-fi hip hop beats to study to. And it's nothing challenging, nothing weird, just, ah, uh, classical music. Now Handel's Messiah. So George Friedrich Handel, he was a uh, British composer who composed one of the most famous melodies of all time. Even if you grew up in a cave, you know this melody. It's, it's this. That's the Messiah. The Piano Guys. The Piano Guys are a musical group consisting of John Schmidt on the piano and uh, Stephen Sharp Nelson on the cello. The famous one being the mashup of Let It Go and Vivaldi's Four Seasons, specifically Winter. You know it right here. You probably have seen this one before. They made a billion others and it's really easy for people to enjoy because there's a lot of familiarity and it makes you feel very like, well, it's good feeling music, you know? Mozart, Baby's Smart. Mozart makes baby smart. This is the theory that if music is played for a baby that is by the composer Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, that they're gonna somehow become smarter. By listening to that, they're gonna connect a lot more, you know, synapses and all this stuff, and they're gonna grow up a lot more intelligent. One of the most famous examples of people doing this, you know, and capitalizing on this idea are the baby Mozart music. Ode to Joy, the famous finale to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, titled The Ode to Joy. You know it as this. Musicologists describe this, music historians, they, they say it's like the ending of the classical era and the beginning of the romantic era. As if Beethoven said, no more classical, now things are romantic. There's a reason it's famous. You should really listen to it if you've never actually listened to the full symphony. Film music, you need an explanation. John Williams, Hans Zimmer, you know. The Nutcracker, Tchaikovsky, he's a Russian composer and he made this very, very, very famous ballet today known as The Nutcracker, played by every ballet, like every year around the holiday season. It's also famously in that one Eminem's commercial, the, he does exist, they do exist. Santa. It's The Nutcracker and Tchaikovsky's great. Check out his other stuff. Mickey Mouse, it's in reference to the famous bit from Fantasia, Mickey Mouse having a broomstick that comes to life and he does it through magic to the music of the Sorcerer's Apprentice by Duca. <laughs> or Duguess, du du guess, du guess. I don't know, I, <laughs> I'm not good, I'm <laughs> sorry. That's it for level zero. We're on to level one, The Four Seasons by Vivaldi. Uh, the Four Seasons, it's uh, a very famous string quartet piece that each movement is based off of a different season. Most people know it for spring, which is this one. Now there's the Vitamin String Quartet. This one, they rose to fame because of iTunes. They're known very famously for their string quartet covers of a bunch of pop music, especially like 
indie branded stuff or like, you know, rock. They actually aren't just a set of like four musicians playing. It's actually more of an idea, like a collective. So each fighting the string quartet, you know, it's just a bunch of musicians in the LA area that decide to record the next up. Claire de Lune. So Claude Debussy, he wrote this piece called Claire de Lune, which many people consider to be the most beautiful piano piece written ever with the most gorgeous melody. You, you know what is this? There's a video of a guy playing Claire de Lune to uh, an elephant. Rhapsody in Blue. It's the I hate classical music. I think it's just boring. It's not for me. And you turn this piece on and then they go, oh, I love this. To me, it's the quintessential example of a piece of music that people have heard at one point or another, but they can never quite name. So they hear it and they go, what is that? Oh, oh, what is that? I need to check that out because I've always, I've been looking for this my entire life and now you're playing it and that's what it, Fantasia and Fantasia 2000. I've already mentioned this movie before with the Mickey Mouse one, the Sorcerer's Apprentice thing, but um, basically these movies, the first one in particular was Walt Disney's masterpiece, which is like the thing that he was the most proud of creating. The concept of it is they take a bunch of classical music and they animate stuff over it of what they think kind of the music represents. Famous ones in it include like the Rite of Spring, you know, with the dinosaurs and all that stuff. And then there's like the flamingos and, um, and the hippo, the ballerina hippo. Then there's Fantasia 2000. It's not really as well received because there's a lot of weird things they took. And you know, that one has whales flying into the sky. Bach cello suite. Johann Sebastian Bach. So he was the god of Western classical music. The way that he would write and compose was literally the manual for how to write music to this day. But the piece that he's most well known for, if people say the word cello, the first thing in a lot of people's heads is the that's my <laughs> musical impression. Um, that's the Bach cello suite number one. Ave Maria! It's a famous aria written by Franz Schubert. I'm, I mean, I don't need to say too much. It's also in Fantasia. The New World Symphony, written by Dvorak. This was his final symphony that he wrote, his ninth symphony, and he wrote it while he was teaching in America. A lot of the music in it is inspired by kind of African-American folk music that was brought over. He wanted to create the charm that a lot of that folk music brought, and he wanted to put it in his symphony, which is why it's called the New World Symphony. One of my favorite pieces of all time. Check it out. Um, if you haven't already, you'll recognize it. I bet you're gonna recognize it. Level two, The Rite of Spring Riot. Igor Stravinsky's ballet, The Rite of Spring, it premiered in Paris in 19... 1913, sorry, I'm not good with dates. 1913, and at the time, this was incredibly edgy, incredibly hard, incredibly awesome. It seems kind of tame by today's standards of what we're used to, but like, back then, this was edgy. This was like causing deep, deep, in a lot of people and so the famous story is that there was some kind of riot that happened at the premiere because it was just so so emotionally charged and raw and while there are stories that say people were riding down the streets of Paris because of this those by historical accounts don't actually happen to be true instead there's a lot of reports that happened on that day saying that people in the audience were going nuts kind of similar ish to like let's say like a like a hard punk like a punk rock concert but it's like the 1913 version. So people were, there was probably a little bit of hoodlin, hoodlumism, punches and all that stuff, but in the concert hall, I didn't really quite leave outside of that. But nonetheless, it still was quite a big deal. I mean, who riots over a classical work, right? Leonard Bernstein's compositions. You know who Leonard Bernstein is. He wrote West Side Story. The rest of his compositions are also very beautiful and prominent. He was a celebrity, super, super celebrity at the time. He was the conductor of the New York Philharmonic, probably the most famous one that's ever existed. He brought to life a lot of music that um, was kind of lost through time. He was the guy for Western classical music for a very, very long time, and he still is. I already spent too much time. He's a good guy. Just check him out, okay? Symphony of a Thousand, aka Gustav Mahler's Eighth Symphony. Just like Bernstein, he was a composer and a conductor but nowadays he's just recognized as one of the famous forgotten composers. He was forgotten at the time because people didn't really like him. Mahler was especially a dick. There was like legends of people going after him with baseball bats after uh, rehearsals. Being a tough, tough dude. It's called the Symphony of a Thousand because it takes about a thousand performers to actually do it. And here, like, let me just pull up this list just to tell you exactly how many things that they have to have required to perform this piece, but including two piccolos, uh, four flutes, two piccolos on its own, and four flutes, four oboes, chord leaves, uh, that's the English horn, um, clarinets, B-flat clarinet, E-flat clarinet, bass clarinet, two, four bassoons, and a contra bassoon, a bunch of percussion, 
keyboards including organ, celesta, piano, harmonium. Oh man, eight horns, eight trumpets, four of them are off stage, of course. Seven trombones, three of them are off stage, of course. A two, one, only one tuba, poor guy. Uh, strings, just mandolin, and two harps, preferably doubled, so four harps preferred. Um, and of course, all the other string players, so big, big, big. Then there's like the vocal side, like they have soloists, including three soprano soloists, two solos, <laughs> three soprano soloists, two alto soloists, tenor, better tone, bass, then two soprano, alto, tenor, bass, big choirs, two of them, and then a children's choir to add to it as well. That's a lot of people. Big deal, huge, huge symphony. Too big, it's too big. Four minutes and 33 seconds. This is referring to John Cage's composition, four minutes and 33 seconds. Why is this piece famous? Well, it's four minutes and 33 seconds of silence, and that's it. There's three movements to it, but the whole time, the guy conducts, he goes, and the music is supposed to be just the sounds of the environment. People coughing, the cars outside, you know, whatever it might be, but the music that's supposed to be created in four minutes and 33 seconds is just what is all around us. Is it music? What's music? 2001, A Space Odyssey. This one I'm referring to the, the opening music. That piece, it's actually also Sprach Sarasustra by Richard Strauss. It's actually kind of interesting. This this work was written to be performed at this once very specific church because it starts with this very, very low organ, or organ? <laughs> organ note that goes boom. And that note is supposed to resonate the entire hall. So when that note is played, the whole thing just <laughs> The Ring Cycle, written by Wagner, is four operas that are kind of supposed to be performed back to back, or at least in rapid succession of each other, so one a day. Each of these operas are three hours long, so altogether the Ring of the Nibelung is what it's called, is 12 hours total. A lot of Lord of the Rings stuff is kind of based off of this. It was the birth of light motifs, which are little pieces of music that represent a thing. Take, for example, like um, the Force theme in Star Wars, or even in Lord of the Rings, like Sauron's theme. The Ring Cycle was the first thing to ever do that. It was the first to really have these things in play to the story that's being told. It's also a very theatrical opera, and it is very much about the story more than anything. Shostakovich denounced Dmitry Shostakovich. He was a composer in the Soviet Union during the reign of Stalin. Stalin. He was a very well-known and prolific composer. A lot of good things were coming from him. That is until he released this thing called Lady Macbeth of the Mitzik District, which is an edgy, edgy, edgy opera about dark themes that I can't mention without getting demonetized or anything like that. It was released to a lot of criticism, specifically Pravda is the name of the paper that it was released in. And there was an article that was called Muddle instead of Music, and it was a complete criticism of Shostakovich's opera. And it was clear that it was secretly written by Stalin himself. If things didn't quite follow the rules of the Soviet Union, then Bad things happen to you. Bad things happen to you. Bad things happen to you.